So we are definitely live on YouTube now. So if you'd like to start, or okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Today is uh, the 15th of March, 2021. I'm going to call the Operations Advisory Committee agenda to order. Could we have a roll call, please, Kayla? Yeah. Committee members Dave Coro. Present. Emily LaPrade. Present. Philip McLeod. Here. John Shane. Wait, say it. Present. Gabriel Flowers. Vice Chair Chris Toner. Here. And Chair Dan Lynch. Here. Adoption of the agenda, please. <clears throat> Be a result that the agenda for the Operations Advisory Committee meeting dated Monday, March 15th, 2021 be adopted. A mover, please. Phil, seconder, Chris. I'll second that. Okay. Any questions or amendments? Hearing none, those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. <clears throat> Adoption of the minutes of the previous meeting, 7 October 2019. Just make sure there's no disclosures of pecuniary interest, Mr. Nope. Chair. I don't no. think there are any, but. <laughs> just, just to cover the bases, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest on the committee? Seeing none, none. Okay. Perfect. That the Operations Advisory Committee approve the minutes listed under item 5A on the agenda. <clears throat> Mover and seconder, please. David. I'll move that. Uh, John, any questions or comments? No. Nope. Just uh, one to the general manager, general manager of operations. On our last meeting, John was in uh, the 19th of October of 2019. We had uh, page three was the sidewalk clearing. Can you provide this committee with information dealing with any problems of having not having the sidewalks cleaned on Arthur and Charles Street? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I checked with, with Steve, our operations supervisor, and, and uh, checked uh, what complaints or concerns we had received. And, and the only one that we had re received was one, uh, one sort of typical concern uh, on Arthur Street with respect to uh, oh. slippery sidewalk condition one day. Um, so very minimal amount of, of concerns that were raised and, and of course the operations uh, staff did address that concern uh, immediately and uh, applied some grit uh, that day when there were some slippery conditions but uh, but otherwise the uh, the concerns received this year uh, were, were quite limited so good news part b was uh, the bus stop snow removal there was going to be a part-time individual to look into mm -hmm. the yeah, so if I recall the conversation uh, from that point in time, there, there was a question as to whether or not our new, uh, we had hired one and a half additional operators or laborers, skilled laborers, if you will, um, when we decided to bring the sidewalk snow clearing service in-house and purchase the sidewalk machines ourselves. Um, so those operators obviously did a lot more than just um, sort of focus on those bus stop areas. <laughs> they basically did all the sidewalk snow clearing, but Certainly we made efforts this year to, to clear the areas that we knew of, the, the, the bus stop areas that we are aware of. If you recall, there was some discussion, I think it was at the council level uh, with respect to some challenges we were having with actually obtaining any type of a map uh, or full list from the uh, Joint Transportation Consortium with respect to uh, bus stop locations, but certainly where we do know they exist, uh, there were others <coughs> this year. Thank you, and a last question, the agreement with the villa the sidewalk that goes from the villa to Daniel Street, uh, whether they were going to maintain it or we were going to maintain it, did we ever uh, resolve that? We did, yes. Um, I had a, a note in the file from from when this came up last year, and uh, we did. I immediately followed up after that meeting with uh, Mr. Illingsworth, who's who at the time anyway was uh, property maintenance. Uh, uh, manager, if you will, at the villa, and he had advised that they were maintaining it, and they already had a contractor lined up uh, for that was in the past winter, but uh, presumably it's the same contractor that they continue to use now, so they are maintaining it. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Hearing none, those uh, in favor of the minutes from October. 
Those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. <coughs> Presentations. A OPP statistical report. The Operations Advisory Committee received the OPP statistical report as information. Mover and seconder, please. Chris, Phil, Inspector. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, I apologize for my video. I don't know what's going on on my end, but I seem to have technical difficulties. I haven't been able to iron out this Zoom thing yet in the last year. Um, just to summarize the call for service billing report that I sent everyone prior to the meeting, um, year to date comparison calls for service, um, we're down 182.7 billable hours. Violent crime uh, remains relatively consistent. We're only down about 16 uh, hours. Property crime has seen a decrease above 104 bill buyers or what equates to 16 calls for service. Gas drive-offs and fraud seem to be the biggest contributor to this decline. We've had less of those uh, year to date than we did in 2020. Other criminal code uh, offenses have been down 56 billable hours. Drug possession is down 13 billable hours. Our statutes and acts are up slightly by 3.4 hours. Mental health uh, related calls seem to continue to be the biggest concern in this area. There are two prolific persons uh, who suffer from mental health issues that reside in Iron Empire that seem to drive um, this area up the most. Um, the person number one had 29 calls for service in 2020. Um, <coughs> and person number two had 24 calls for service in 2020. That's a big significant part of that, uh, that section of the billable uh, calls. Um, both are engaged with mental health and have crisis workers and uh, case workers assigned to them. They just are ongoing dealing with their issues. Operational, we're up slightly by 36 hours. Uh, operational two uh, stays relatively consistent uh, with only down about 3.9 hours and our traffic seems to be down about 30 hours. And that summarizes the call for service billing report. <coughs> Any questions to the inspector? No. Just, uh, just a couple and inspectors on page uh, eight, I noticed that there's two assault on police officers. Um, personally, I don't like to see that. Uh, please tell me it wasn't in Iron Prior. Uh, yes, both occurred at uh, the Iron Prior Hospital. Uh, they were involving people who were suffering from mental health uh, crises at the time. One was a young person who was uh, acting out and a female officer was assaulted. Another two is the person mentioned uh, in, above the, per the prolific person number one for mental health calls. Um, he was apprehended. The officer was assaulted by himself and his support person, his sister, who was at the hospital with them. Um, this has been an ongoing issue with these parties and they're not, it's nothing new for us. So as Christina as it is, it, they're isolated uh, occurrences related to mental health. So I want to think back on when we had uh, <laughs> inspectors here, there was some sort of a consortium of team players, the, the mental health, the OPP, I'm not too sure if the fire were involved, but when the 911 call was made, someone made the decision on who was going to be called. And if it was a mental health, then the mental health guy would attend and the OPP would be the back in the background, or is the OPP now in the forefront and the mental guy in the back, or the mental uh, company person will say. Um, we still work in partnership with mental health and we have the mental health crisis team uh, response team workers with us in detachment. And now that COVID's kind of changed a bit, they're back out uh, in the forefront. But at the end of the day, when somebody calls 911 in crisis, first and foremost, it's the OPP that's being dispatched. Okay. Um, and whenever there's any type of uh, tendency for any type of violence, it, it's always us. And mental health and um, other services are kind of following up after the fact. Thank you. And the last question I have is on page nine under drug possession. It's got the, uh, we have none or no drug enforcement this time around. However, uh, reading the paper in the news, the opioids or opiates or whatever they're called, uh, people are dying. Uh, have we got any issues in arm prior or concerns at this point? 
I think there's concerns within every community. Our empire is not obsolete to that concern um, or the risk posed by opiates. And, and namely, mostly it's fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives, um, whether it be synthetic or um, natural, um, naturally uh, existing. We have seen uh, overdoses related to opioids along with overdoses related to fatalities. Um, so in 2020, uh, Iron Pride had one suspected opioid related death. Um, the deceased was a known um, drug addict, um, had a previous overdose in 2019 and was revived at that time using naloxone. Uh, we had in Renfrew County, sorry, not Renfrew, in the Renfrew Detachment area, there was one additional um, fatal overdose that's expected to be related to opioids. We had 10 other additional overdose, not opioid related. We had one non-opioid fatal overdose and seven suspected overdose non-opioid related. And it goes on to 2018, 2019. So we're not obsolete from it. We're not protected from it. It, it is a concern. It's a concern all the, through the detachment <clears throat> area and in our empire as well. It's not as um, pronounced in iron prior as you see in some of our other areas. Um, but it, the risk is there and the risk is real. And uh, we do our best to investigate every, uh, every report of a, an overdose and drug occurrence. Thank you, Inspector. Any other questions from the committee? Chris? Thank you. Hi, Don. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to continue on with the, op with the, opioid crisis here in Renfrew County. And when I looked at the report by the Canadian Public Health Association, uh, you know, they went down through the list of uh, governments, you know, what, what, can, what, what can the federal government do? What can the provincial government do? Um, when it gets down to the municipalities, they suggest, this is, what they said, it's, it's only a short paragraph. I, you know, they recommend for the municipalities like Arm Prior to support and provide harm reduction and health promotion services necessary to mitigate the opioid crisis in their towns. Uh, so I'm asking you like, what, what can we do as the town of Arm Prior to, I mean, what, what does what does that mean? What can we do to maybe help help the citizens of Armprior that you know if they are suffering or if they're thinking about doing something um, they choose not to? I just I'm just looking for you for guidance on what can we do as a town, um, you know, to to support and provide harm reduction services and mitigate the opioid crisis in our town? I think it's to continue to promote the Good Samaritan Act uh, and to encourage people to report um, overdoses and the use of uh, opioids, um, that they're, they're protected under the Good Samaritan Act, um, to report suspicious activity and, to, and drug activity within their communities. Bigger okay. municipalities, I know they talk about the safe patch and safe um, needle sites where they can have safe usage. Um, I don't know if we're there in Arm Prior yet. Uh, I'd say the biggest way to support our community is make us through awareness. Um, the OPP has a framework where we investigate all um, suspected overdoses and where somebody ha is, has deceased because of an overdose and we can track it back. We have in cases dating back to 2018, laid charges from manslaughter, criminal negligence, calm death, as well as trafficking in a controlled substance um, as a result of these overdoses and the investigations that um, come out of uh, the fatalities. Uh, every case where there's a fatality, it is a criminal investigations bureau, a detective inspector is assigned to, as a case manager to oversee it and to follow through the investigations. Okay, so then maybe, I mean, as a, a, as a town, uh, you just think that if we were just to, raise the awareness on, you know, obviously the, um, the bad effects, obviously of opioid use or of any drug use for that matter. Um, I mean, that, this, that, that's basically what the Canadian public health are saying, that's all we really have to do. So um, 
I just don't know if, if Iron Pryor is doing that. And I'm just looking, yeah, maybe I'll have to investigate that, uh, Dan. We'll have to maybe find some ways that if we can get like a public address out there, or I don't know if it's worth, you know, putting up a billboard. Uh, it's no, it's just something because I would certainly hate for it to take hold in our lovely town. And, uh, you know, it can do some damage pretty swiftly. Um, and, you know, I'd feel really bad that if we just didn't, if we didn't do something, um, you know, I, it would. Maybe it would we be, can uh, recommend to council that we uh, narrate a letter to our school boards. Sure, anything, yes. But they're going to have their uh, electronic signs to put a little, you know, you got a problem with opioids, uh, here's a number to call momentarily. Yeah. And then uh, maybe we can get a hold of Lindsay and put it on our webpage just to say, hey, if you've got issues with this, there's an avenue to go, don't don't be alone type thing, you know? Yeah. Something that we can, we can, we can work at. So if, yep. that, uh, if that's uh, yep. in favor of everyone else, we'll have uh, Chris do the motion for that and we'll need a seconder. Okay. And we'll do a little bit more discussion. We're good to go. So by Chris, second by Phil, that the council be requested to yep. promote yep. education on opioid uh, use or misuse within the town of Iron Prior through whatever means possible. Sound good? Yep. 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 Thank you, Dan. Yep. Any just other Mr. questions? Mr. Chair, just need a, a carried first on the first motion that was um, put forward for to receive the statistical report as information, and then we can go through and carry the second motion. Okay. So, so all those in favor of the report as information carried, and now we have a mover and seconder for the recommendation to council. Those so as moved by Chris, seconded by sorry. By Phil. Phil. Yep. Okay. All those in favor? Carried. Perfect. We're on to the next uh, report, which is the Emergency Management 2020 Review with uh, Corey. Please, Kayla. Yep. That the Operations Advisory Committee at their meeting held on March 15, 2021, acting in the capacity of the Town's Emergency Management Program Committee, has reviewed A, the 2020 Emergency Management Program for the Town of Barnprior and has verified compliance with the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, and B, Emergency Management Program objectives for 2021 and supports the program direction as presented. Seconder, please. Emily and Chris. And I'm just going to put up a presentation. So just give me one moment. Thanks, this Kayla. Is we, this is where we have some issues. Kayla, when you take over the screen, half of my screen is there so we don't get to read it all. Is there some way to get to read it all? You should be able to just give me one moment, Dan, because I think I, I fixed that. Okay. Uh, Perfect. You'll be able to see the whole thing here. Okay. Just give me one sec, Corey, just a second. I just noticed, there we go. Okay, perfect. So now you should be able to see everything there. Yep. Are you good, Corey? Yeah, I'm good. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll get started there. Uh, I'm just going to provide you with a quick review of our emergency management uh, program for 2020 because we didn't meet uh, last year and uh, some of our 2021 initiatives uh, for everybody here. So I guess I'll start with the spring freshet, which we're currently approaching right now. Um, so just some background, on March 3rd, 2020, our C, uh, Community Emergency Management Coordinators in Renfrew County conducted our pre-spring pre Freshette meeting with the goal to bring people and organizations within Renfrew County uh, with a role in spring Freshette communications and emergency management together to share some information in order to be prepared for uh, any high water events. 
some of the agencies in attendance were our Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, Ontario Power Generation, Renfrew Power Generation, the Ottawa River Regulation Secretariat, and the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management. At that time in 2020, uh, the northern snowpack and water body ice coverage, projected precipitation, and temperature forecasts were trending towards normal spring conditions, which uh, and on March 10th, our local uh, municipal emergency control group, we did meet to discuss the lessons learned from 2017 and the 2019 flood. Uh, we discussed tactical operations should the municipality once again be affected by high waters in 2020. Uh, moving ahead to now spring for SHEC 2021, our community emergency management uh, coordinator group did just meet again on March 4th. Um, and essentially, there, there has been some considerable snow melt over the past few weeks and with favorable weather in the forecast. So if things continue this way, um, all signs point to us trending towards normal spring conditions. So that's, um, that's favorable for, for everybody. But I will keep the group, po group posted if anything changes. I am working on my communications package that I will send out to all of the flood-affected um, residents. Uh, this year is going to focus more heavily on um, just information as to where they can get proper in information um, regarding um, flooding, uh, weather, that's, that sort of thing, um, should, uh, should they need it or should the situations begin to, to change rapidly. Uh, next one, Caleb, please. So now the big one, our COVID-19 impacts to our uh, emergency management program. So again, I'll bring you back to 2020. Um, as the threat of COVID-19 in increased at the onset of 2020, the Town of Armprar developed and implemented internal policies, procedures, and training for staff, as well as actively uh, disseminated accurate and up-to-date support information to the general public. Uh, once these were firmly established, these initiatives, I believe, helped uh, to preserve public health interests throughout the course of the pandemic, which, of course, I think was evidenced by um, our, our great response here in town. So just some timelines for you because there were some definitely some impacts to um, emergency management programs. On March 17, 2020, a declaration of emergency was made by the province of Ontario pursuant to Section 7.01 of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Subsequently, Council decided at their special meeting held on April 14, 2020, that all Council and Advisory Committee meetings regularly scheduled should be suspended out of an abundance of caution, which is why we didn't meet. Uh, June 26, 2020, the Ministry of the Solicitor General released Guidance Note 2020-0626 regarding our annual emergency management training requirements with consideration given to the COVID-19 situation. So in brief, this guidance note uh, extended the timeline for our newly appointed uh, community emergency management coordinators to complete their required courses uh, to December 31st, 21, or one year from their date of appointment, which didn't really affect us here in town because we have established community emergency management coordinators with myself and Director Steckley. Uh, it also acknowledged acknowledge that the required training for our municipal control group members has already likely been achieved through our engagement in our response to the COVID-19 emergency this year. So they let us uh, take a pass on our training for our control group members for that one. Um, on September 4th, 2020, uh, our Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief of Emergency Management Ontario uh, released a memo which announced a one-time amendment to, the, to Regulation 38004 under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. Uh, the amendment exempted the requirement for ministries and municipalities to conduct an annual exercise in 2020. Um, again, the amendment took into consideration the emergency response activities that municipal emergency control groups were actively engaged in as, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, November 16, 2020, uh, and a, and a, a new announcement, um, our uh, field officer, Philippe Geoffrion, uh, has retired, a long-standing field officer from Emergency Management Ontario, and we were joined by um, Meyer, Maya Foster as the permanent bilingual field officer in the capital sector, replacing uh, Philippe. December 14, 2020, our municipal compliance document was submitted to Emergency Management Ontario for review. Um, 
Currently, the town is not listed as compliant with that legislation as this committee did not meet to be provided a summary of our emergency management activities before compliance submission deadlines uh, due to COVID-19. Um, I did discuss this matter with Field Officer Foster in 2020, and as there were no significant changes to the plan or emergency program requiring vetting through this committee, uh, it was noted that the committee could be briefed once meetings resumed in 2021, which is what I'm doing um, here today. So I will provide uh, Field Officer Foster with this update that I've given you through our OAC committee meeting, and she will change that uh, standing from non-compliant uh, to compliant. And we're certainly, we're not the only municipality um, in that position right now. It's, uh, it's a, a lot of people are in the same boat. So that's it for that one, please, Kayla. So now we're moving into our 2021 program objectives. Again, for our staff training, things are moving ahead uh, full force with our staff training. Um, I, in, in, in conversation with Field Officer Foster, um, she kind of let us know that, the, that although we're still kind of in the, the pandemic situation, that really that one time, uh, we're getting that just that, that one time grace for our emergency management exercise and training our municipal control group. I think it's everybody, uh, municipalities and, and local government, we kind of have things well established where we are able to meet remotely and conduct training remotely, that sort of thing. So, so that's taken into consideration. So staff will continue to train on the new IMS-driven plan. Um, our annual exercise, we, again, we are going to engage the Lumex, Lumex group uh, to discuss the logistics of conducting another uh, emergency exercise by mid-2021. They've got some uh, solutions for us that we're going to be able to, uh, to work through to make sure we do this uh, safely within the, the restrictions of the pandemic and public guidelines. And uh, public education programs, we are going to continue with our established public education programs as scheduled for 2021. Um, there are a few minor tweaks, of course, that we have to make, especially with regards to um, some of our school-age programming as well as our emergency management programming uh, for ADHS. Again, we're looking at um, putting some of those programs out through the use of uh, Zoom and, and other mediums like that. For the next one, Kayla. And so my recommendation, as Kayla read, uh, that the Operations Advisory Committee at their meeting held on March 15, 2021, acting in the capacity of our town's Emergency Management Program Committee, has a uh, the 2020 Emergency Management Plan has reviewed the 2020 Emergency Management Program for the town of Armfrey and has verified compliance with the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. Again, there were no significant changes to the plan or program. Uh, due to the pandemic, and B, uh, they've reviewed the emergency management program objectives for 2021 and supports the program direction as presented, if you so do. I'll go back. To Any, questions? Thank you. Any questions for Corey? Hearing none. So, Kayla, I think we'll break this into two, please. We'll do the uh, Part B as a information, and then we'll do the recommendation as a motion. I just read the motion. I didn't take. The, I didn't do a recommend. I didn't do an information one for this one, Dan. I just literally read Corey's motion. So we don't need an information if because his says that in it too. So. Okay. Then we'll, uh, we'll ask for a recorded vote. Then, please. Okay. All right, so we have citizen member John Shane. Yes, okay. Citizen member Philip McLeod. Yes, okay. Citizen member Emily Laprad. Okay. Dave Coro. Uh, yes. Okay. Vice Chair Chris Toner. Yes. And Chair Dan Lynch. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, Part C, the fire department, please, Kayla. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to, uh, and Mr. Chair and Kayla, I'm just going to leave the meeting. We have our recruit training tonight. I've got a few recruits uh, waiting for me, so I'm going to join in uh, with uh, recruits. So forgive me for leaving the meeting. Not a problem. Thanks, Corey. Have a good night. Sorry. Thanks for the Corey. 
Okay, so that the Operations Advisory Committee received the Fire Department report as information. Mover and seconder, please. I'll second that. Phil and Dave. Chief, please. Just give me a moment. I have a presentation to get up for the chief. Is everybody able to see that now? Yep, all yep. good. Perfect, Chief, you're good to go. Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone. Fire department recap for 2020. We did tender for a new water rescue vehicle to replace the 18 year old pickup. And that uh, vehicle is due to arrive at the end of this week, I'm hoping. Uh, we updated our ENR bylaw. We purchased new water rescue equipment. We continue to provide high quality training to firefighters following NFPA standards by purchasing an online training program for COVID. And we uh, had intended to increase <coughs> staffing through spring recruitment. Next slide, Kayla. So for the ENR bylaw, as per the fire master plan, the ENR bylaw was updated to reflect that Deputy Chief Zarmia becoming a full-time position and the fire prevention and protection officer, which is Corey, given the rank of uh, captain. And the organizational chart was updated to reflect those changes. And just another couple of changes for uh, clarity purposes. The word lieutenant was changed to lieutenants and four captains was amended to captains just for clarity purposes. So uh, we bought some new water west rescue equipment uh, under a capital project. Uh, the, the personal flotation devices and ropes were replaced because they were past their 10 year life cycle. And four new survival suits were also purchased. So those are the yellow Mustang suits that we wear when we go in the water, when we go in the ice uh, cold water. Uh, I, continue to stress the importance of training for everyone. Today's fires burn hotter and faster due to lightweight construction. Firefighters are arriving on scene at the same time that floors and roofs are beginning to fail. So it's imperative that firefighters are trained on these dangers as well as all aspects of firefighting and practice regularly. And as I mentioned before, we did purchase a new online training program to tide us over through the COVID year <clears throat> so for staffing, we need to have adequate staff to keep ahead of staff resignations and retirement. And as you know, we do have several large uh, housing developments underway in our prior and before we know it, those will have people in it. So we want to keep our staffing levels ahead of, of those curves so that we continue to maintain a, a well-trained and rapidly deployable force. So we asked uh, the OAC last meeting, the October of 2019 meeting, if, if we could increase our minimum staff from, 40, from 36 to 40, and that was endorsed by the OAC, uh, provided that no capital cost increase. The new recruitment process was completed. It was started in the fall of 2020. 20 and we uh, hired 13 recruits this January, January 2021. And they, uh, they're training every Monday night. So this is their third Monday night. So they're, they're pretty fresh, pretty green and it's exciting to have them around. So just some notable numbers for 2019 and then I'll move on to 2020 afterwards just so you can see a comparison. 2019, we responded to 154 calls. We had 49 training sessions. We did 98 inspections, 254 smoke alarm home visits. We participated in 20 community events and we issued 103 burn permits. For 2020, we had 164 calls, so a little bit up, 47 in-person training sessions, 20 at-home online training sessions. We did split our force into two groups during the COVID year and we had them respond week on, week off. 
And we also had them train week on, week off, so that at no time did we have our full force in the station at any one time. And that, and that was a measure to, uh, to limit the spread of COVID. And uh, we did 67 inspections. We had 224 burn permits issued, so more than double the burn permits. We had to cancel our home smoke alarm visits due to COVID. And our fire prevention week school visits, we still did them. Typically, would, we would go inside the school and do the education program in the classrooms, but we, we stayed outside with the fire truck and Sparky and the kids came outside and stayed on the other side of the fence. And Rick did his uh, prevention and education message and interaction with Sparky through the fence. So we did continue that. So our 2021 initi initiatives and objectives are to fully train the new recruits apart from regular staff until they're brought to a level where they can join regular maintenance training. So that's, we do that because uh, the new recruits are obviously pretty green. They have to be brought up to the same level as regular staff before they can partake in regular training. So that's why we do it on a separate night. We find it more efficient that way. Uh, we will continue to provide in-house training to NFPA standards and we'll work with the OFM and OAFC to find high quality standardized affordable training for firefighters due to the closing of the fire college. And we have no capital projects scheduled for this year. So the recommendation is that the operations advisory committee at its March 2021 meeting received this PowerPoint as information as presented. Any questions? Are, are you having any issues uh, with new recruits, uh, Jeff? No, none at all. We're, uh, <laughs> we have 13 recruits. We have them spaced out in our training room. They all wear masks the entire time they're here and they, they screen themselves in when they come into the building. So we are continuing to follow strict COVID uh, yeah. policy. Right. Thank you. Bill, did you have a question? Phil, no question? You're muted. No. Oh, so Chief, just uh, one point was you got uh, the equipment for the people going into the cold water that there was four suits purchased. Do we have enough for not all of our staff, but those people trained to have the, the proper equipment? Like I, I gotta say that, you know, you're bigger than I am and Chris is bigger than both of us. So there's gotta be different sizes to these things. Actually, these uh, cold water immersion suits are quite big. They're made to uh, one size fits all. And uh, we do have enough of them. We did buy four new ones, but we still had eight older ones that are still in usable condition. So we have plenty of suits and, uh, and they fit everybody, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions to the chief? Seeing none, I'll ask for the vote. All those in favor, please. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, six, six D, Kayla, please. Ottawa Street. Mr. Chair, if I may, I'd like to excuse myself from the meeting as well to take part in the recruit training, if that's okay. Not a problem, Chief. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. That the Operations Advisory Committee receive this presentation as information and provide staff with feedback concerning the ongoing review to potentially covert convert Ottawa Street from its current two-way traffic flow configuration to a one-way street between John Street and Harrington Street. Mover and seconder, please. Emily, Chris, John, please. I have a presentation, Mr. Chair. Just give me one moment. Okay. Everyone can see that. Okay. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, uh, Chair Lynch. So this uh, this topic has has been uh, in the discussion for for quite some time now. Um, it was sort of brought to to our attention or brought to light uh, in late 2019, I would say, uh, formally by 
some representatives from the schools in, in the area. So being the, the high school, um, the uh, Walters Auto and um, St. Joe's Catholic as well, uh, all in that general vicinity of town. Um, but the topic itself has been raised uh, in past years to my knowledge. I haven't necessarily been uh, included in, in some of those past discussions, some of them predate myself, but uh, I have heard and, and made, been made aware just from a discussion at council last year that um, the topic is not necessarily new. So um, the concerns that were raised in late 2019 were really with respect to um, traffic movements on Ottawa Street in front of the, uh, the high school and Walter Zotto. Um, and it's really primarily with respect to uh, traffic congestion and the high volume of vehicular and pedestrian traffic volumes at the peak times of day. So or the early morning and the, the afternoon um, school, school times, the drop off and pickup times. <laughs> So um, obviously the students in these, at all these schools travel uh, to and from the school in, in various ways, including uh, walking, being uh, schools within, within the urban center of the town. Um, a lot of students uh, also get uh, school transportation on a school bus and uh, a number of children are also uh, picked up and, and dropped off uh, by their parents or their guardians um, in the morning and evening. Next slide, Carol. So this is a, a general overview map of the area. It's an aerial photo from our uh, GIS mapping system, but can you see my, my cursor on the screen or no? No, that'd be Kayla's, I guess. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, right in the center, that's Bell Street up the center of the, uh, of the map there. And that's, uh, that's the main route uh, for school buses. So school buses travel up Bell Street. Uh, they travel up in along the high school parking lot uh, to the north of the page there. And they drop off students to all three schools in, in the sort of the rear of the high school area. And then they come back out um, through that same way and, and travel back down Bell Street and then kind of disperse in various directions. Um, so that that's kind of the main uh, bus route. But then of course, We've got uh, parents and guardians and, uh, and students themselves, uh, high school students who have their driver's license, traveling in all different manners, all different directions, um, trying to access school, pick up, drop off, uh, and in a lot of cases looking to actually park for, uh, for a period of time throughout the day. So that section uh, that the cursor is showing right there is, is the main section in front of the schools that would be in front of the high school in Walters Auto, um, and that's primarily where majority of the concerns are, ra are raised. However, there are some concerns um, in some of the, uh, the adjacent blocks as well. Um, next slide, please, Gail. Did I not? Okay. Oh, there it goes. Sorry, it's just a little slow getting through. Um, so the, this is just a visual representation of the current restrictions. So over the last number of years, several years, um, the town of Armprior has um, implemented various restrictions, parking um, and stopping slash no standing uh, parking restrictions, which would be what you see in the middle with the, uh, with the no stop sign there. That would refer to no stopping and standing. So um, that, would, that would actually mean you're not even allowed to stop uh, and drop off or pick up. You're just, you have to keep going through there. So, um, so we have no stopping or standing on that south side of Ottawa between Harriet and Bell. Uh, we have no parking um, on the north side of Ottawa between Harriet and John. We have no parking on the south side of Ottawa between Harriet and Harrington, heading to the west. And then we have a three-hour parking restriction on the north side of Ottawa Street between Harriet and Harrington. So all of these restrictions are currently in the town's parking bylaw um, only during school hours. So Monday to Friday um, during school hours is when these these restrictions apply. So they don't necessarily apply on weekends or on holidays or what have you. So that gives you an idea of the current restrictions today. So going back to November 15th of 2019, staff from the town of Iron Prayer, uh, including myself, met with representatives from uh, ADHS and Walters Auto Public School on site 
to discuss some of the concerns and potential solutions uh, to traffic congestion and parking issues. So as part of this discussion, we were, uh, we were trying to gather uh, more information as to what some of the specific concerns are and, and maybe some of the uh, potential ways that we could look at uh, improving things there, understanding that it is an old section of town um, in kind of the northern part of town that has only so many ways in and out and with so many schools in the area, uh, there is a lot of people coming and going at the same time. So it's, it's, it's doubtful that we'll be able to solve all the concerns and all the problems, but we're certainly looking at ways that we can improve it and, uh, and mitigate some of these concerns. So as part of that discussion, staff did commit to uh, beginning to review a potential option uh, to convert Ottawa Street from its current two-way traffic flow configuration to a one-way street between John Street and Harrington Street. Um, so again, this was brought to council actually in January of 2020, so just about a year ago now. Um, however, it was scheduled to come to operations committee of March in March of last year, um, and it was only days before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic kind of threw the world uh, into a into a spin, and um, schools were closed, and uh, a lot of us were all working from home and whatnot, and the operations committee meetings were obviously canceled for the year as well. So. Um, bit of a delay on the uh, the review, but we're, we're looking to sort of pick it back up now and, and carry it forward. So this is a visual representation of the area that we are considering at this point uh, and investigating the potential option for converting to a one way. So you're looking at Ottawa Street there again from John Street over to Harrington Street. Um, the idea being that it would, you would be traveling only in the westbound direction, uh, which is primarily the direction of vehicles during the school hours, um, but the remainder of, of Ottawa Street to the to the west uh, to the dead end would remain a two way, and uh, all adjacent streets uh, would remain two way as well. Next slide, please, Kayla. Sorry, there must be a lag, John. Bit of a delay. Yeah, it's just with the. It seems to be with the images. Um, so some of the preliminary considerations that we've tabled for uh, for our review and and uh, and operations committee's consideration is staff have uh, commenced preliminary research to determine what warrants and or guidelines exist when considering such a change to traffic flows. Uh, unfortunately, there is limited standard provincial documents published in Ontario on this specific particular topic. So it's a, it's there's not um, a real prescriptive manner in which we could evaluate whether or not. Um, this one way necessarily suits this area. However, there are a few things that we can certainly take into consideration as part of our review. Um, so staff recommends consideration be given for the Ottawa Street to potentially become one way between John Street North Westerly to Harrington based on the following preliminary factors. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so some of the, the considerations that we are giving it is uh, the first one being provide safer pedestrian travel by eliminating vehicular movements traveling in an easterly direction. So essentially what we're getting at there is uh, when pedestrians and students are looking to walk along the streets and cross the roads, uh, when they're crossing Auto Street, they will not necessarily need to be as concerned um, with vehicular traffic uh, coming in both directions. Obviously, when you're crossing a road, you still need to check both ways just to be sure, but uh, it would make the uh, the volume of traffic coming in both directions is much less and, and can certainly focus on watching for traffic in one direction. Uh, crossing guards may be better able to assess vehicular traffic movements, direction and speed with one way. So similarly, uh, you're kind of watching for that primary flow of traffic from the one direction as opposed to the, to the two-way traffic. Parents and guardians could be restricted to only stopping no parking to drop off on the north side of Ottawa Street, resulting in reduced pedestrian crossings mid-block. Um, so we'd likely be looking at maintaining that restriction uh, directly in front of the school between Bell and Harriet Street um, with the, uh, the no parking restriction, at least on the north side. Improved movement of vehicles through the area. Currently vehicles traveling easterly often wait until the uh, westerly traveling vehicle passes or pulls around a stop vehicle dropping off or picking up students. So this is certainly something that we see uh, often enough, I've seen it firsthand myself uh, during some of our observations, and it can really cause um, a lot of traffic jam down there when somebody 
um, illegally stops uh, and pulls over on the south side in front of the school to pick up or drop someone off with, uh, with vehicles stopped and, and loading and unloading on the north side and then vehicles traveling in the westerly direction, there's virtually not enough space for a car to, it, to also drive in an easterly direction when all four of those cars are trying to, to fit in the same cross section of the road. So that's uh, certainly one of the, the big objectives here that we would be looking to solve by going to a one-way. Travel distance impacts uh, anticipated to be minimal as Bell, Harriet, and Harrington Streets will remain two-way traffic. The greatest increase in travel distance will be motorists wishing to travel north on John Street between Victoria Street, uh, beyond Victoria Street rather, as they will be required to backtrack to Victoria to access John. So what we're trying to say here is um, you know, there's limited destinations. There are a few. There's the hospital, there's the Robert Simpson Park and, and cemetery. But generally speaking, uh, the majority of vehicles coming out of that, that sort of neighborhood, that subdivision, uh, would be traveling in a southern direction, either heading to the downtown, the shopping districts, commercial districts, or uh, heading to the main Highway 417 in and out of town. So there's, we don't anticipate that there would be that much traffic that's that's heading in that north direction on John Street. It is anticipated that one-way restrictions on Ottawa Street will only be minimally uh, reduced southbound traffic flows on John Street. So again, we don't anticipate that there'll be a huge impact based on some of the traffic counts that we have to date. Uh, and similarly, it is anticipated that one-way restrictions on Ottawa Street will only minimally increase eastbound traffic on Victoria Street. Next slide, please. So as part of our uh, consultation process, we are looking to circulate um, a letter with some preliminary information requesting comment and feedback uh, from the following agencies. So everyone um, that you would expect to see in, in such a review, so the OPP, fire department, paramedic services, so all the emergency services, all of the schools, are, so the high school, Walter Zato, uh, St. Joe's Catholic School, as well as um, it was suggested that we circulate to uh, a couple of the parent councils at a couple of the schools as well and try to actually uh, solicit some of those comments from those uh, from those parents as well. Uh, the Renfrew County Joint Transportation Consortium uh, being the school bus line uh, as well we're obviously going to circulate to uh, residents in the in the immediate area of Ottawa, Harrington, Harriet, Bell and Victoria Streets as well to get their feedback. Next slide please. <clears throat> So prior to the traffic impacts um, from COVID-19 pandemic, so obviously uh, traffic flows have uh, drastically changed since the pandemic hit. We hear about this uh, not only locally, but um, across Ontario, Canada, and probably across the world, I would be willing to assume just with all of the um, restrictions that have been imposed by various government levels to stay at home and work from home. And all of these meetings that we're having here now with Zoom and, and not traveling um, to and from work and, and whatnot as often. There's certainly an impact to traffic flows and traffic counts. So we do need to be careful these days when we're trying to obtain traffic count data because it's difficult to determine whether or not this is sort of the new norm um, with you know, people potentially working from home more regularly uh, indefinitely or whether or not you know, things will return back to some sort of a normal state and uh, those, those normal vehicle volumes will return to normal. With this particular case, with it being uh, more so impacted by the school, you still do have that at play. Uh, obviously, some, some children's situation is different. Uh, some children are attending school. Some are, are doing the remote learning from home. Um, and maybe some used to take the bus, maybe now walk or now get a drive. So certainly, there, we expect that there are changes. Um, but we were able to obtain two weeks of traffic data uh, in advance of the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. So it was early 2020, January, February 2020, that we obtained the data. So we do have some, some data that we would consider very representative of, of the, the pre-pandemic situation. And we'll be looking to obtain a, a bit more data just to do a bit of a comparison as well. Um, so as you can see here, this is a snapshot of the traffic count summary. Um, so you've got the number of cars listed in the westbound and eastbound direction, the two columns, and then um, sort of a comparison over a 14 day period, which is how long the, the radar sign was up. Uh, the average weekday, average weekend, the average uh, AM peak and average PM peak. And what you can see here, uh, for the most part throughout with the exception of the weekend, which is obviously a bit of a, 
of a unique time and, and the school doesn't really play into that issue. You can certainly see that the westbound flow of traffic is significantly more. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's essentially doubled, uh, if not more, in some cases, uh, when you look at the, uh, for example, the a.m. weekday, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. peak, um, you know, it's, it's nearly tripled the amount of, uh, of traffic that travels in the eastbound. So certainly it's, it's obvious and clear based on that, that the westbound direction is the, the more, uh, more heavily traveled direction of, of uh, flow of traffic in this area. Next slide, please. So as far as financial considerations, um, nothing extravagant at this point. Stakeholder consultations, you know, we anticipate less than $500 as far as uh, some of our mail outs that we're looking to do. Um, certainly there's other ways that we can get um, this information out uh, to the public as well through social media and our website. Um, but the actual targeted mail outs, uh, you know, we, we don't anticipate anything more than $500, which can be easily handled by the uh, operations department operating budget. And moving forward, should the decision be made uh, to convert Auto Street to a one-way, the, the signs, line painting, advertisements placed in the paper, uh, mail outs, et cetera, you know, they're estimated to be in the range of $5,000. It's sort of a high level estimate at this point. Um, but again, those are within reason that uh, the operations department operating budget can handle and absorb. Uh, and certainly something we would not be looking to obtain special approval from council uh, to fund. So with that, the staff recommendation on the floor this evening is just that the Operations Advisory Committee receive this presentation as information and provide staff with any feedback concerning the ongoing review to potentially convert Auto Street from its current two-way traffic flow configuration to a one-way street between John Street and Harrington Street. And so with that, John, turn it up to any questions. John, John, that would be a permanent change one way or is it a temporary or like a timed thing, just school hours, or is that, that would be a permanent one way? Yeah, we'd be looking just, I think it would be more confusing if we tried to implement it during a certain time period of day. Um, okay. The reality is the, major, the majority of, of the time period, even you know throughout the day, Monday to Friday, um, there is uh, parents and whatnot and students coming and going. So um, to try to revert it back on the weekend, say, I think that would just cause more confusion. Yeah. And, um, and it's really hard to sign that as well. If you're going to commit to the one-way signs, they need to be sort of a permanent okay. fixture. So. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Dan? <laughs> John, it's, uh, we looked at the stats. And first of all, I'll go to my comment. The Renfrew County Dispor, uh school board are going to be putting up those huge uh, neon signs or they may be putting up in front of the school with their two-sided si two formation purposes with their uh, LED lighting if, if they get the approval. So if they're going one way, they're only going to see it one-sided unless they look in their rear view mirror, I guess, where people are walking. So I'm wondering uh, when you're talking to the school board that you Obviously, we're going to say we're going to have a white uh, one-way street, but that may give them a, an idea that they'll put the street sign east-west instead of north-south, so it doesn't catch both if they get it erected. Just, just we can certainly raise that that comment and uh, and just uh, remind them as as they're sort of finalizing their design on the sign. Obviously, there was a bit of a of a time lag there between when we initiated these discussions with the school board and uh, and just that very recent presentation to council yeah. uh, last week on, on the signs. But certainly a valid point and something we'll uh, definitely bring up with them as well. So the other comment is, could we have the one way the other way? And the reason I'm I'm thinking that would be if I'm going to go east, I've, I've dropped off my kids, I get to John Street, I make a right turn, I'm not going to go across two lanes of track if I'm, I'm leaving. People coming to get to the one way could come up Bell, Harriet or Harrington, make the right turn and away they go. The, by going the way you're suggesting, people on John are gonna to have to make a left turn to get on to Ottawa Street, and they could be stopped by the people coming from the hospital. With the stop sign in place at Bell Street, if there's more than 10 cars, then you're going to have a massive backup on John Street. So my thoughts were to have it the other way, where there'll be no stoppage 
on John and there'll be minimal uh, traffic on Victoria because they'll already be turning left either Bell, Harriet to get to the high school. I don't know about the bus line. Yeah, if I follow everything you just said, the, the comment of potential uh, backing up or queuing of, of vehicles on Ottawa Street from Bell to John, certainly a valid comment, I think. Um, something that we can take into further consideration and, and try to try to review that a little bit closer in its in its current situation. Um, but I think there's there's a number of factors that would suggest that the the one way in the westerly direction has benefits as well. And I'm thinking just simply with the uh, the ability to to drop off and pick up, um, you'd be pulling over. Um, more conveniently, I guess, in the westbound. Um, however, with that said, if, if it was a one way, it's not to say that you could not pull over uh, heading in the eastbound direction. It's, it's something we can certainly consider. Um, nothing has been really decided at this point. Uh, again, we're just trying to gather data, um, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting comment anyway. The, the other thing, uh, John, yeah, yeah, yeah. was your uh, statistics on John by turning left. I'm going to say that the 14,000 people that went that way are coming down John Street because there's no stop signs. If they were coming down either Harriet or Bell or whatever, they got to stop at Victoria and then go through, and that, that would be a pain. So if I'm going to the high school, I get on John Street and make a left. And that, I think that's yeah, just 14,000 just people. To, coming. Just to clarify, um, the location of the sign that collected the, the count data was directly in front of the school. So it was in that block between yep. Bell and, and Harriet. So it, it may have captured uh, motorists that were coming up Bell Street and heading west in front of the yep. school as well. That's great. Any other questions for the committee? Hearing none, then we'll, act, uh, we'll take the vote in favor, please. Oh, sorry, Emily, did you have a question? Nope, just voting. Great, all those in favor? Great, carried. Uh, so under paragraph seven, we have uh, matters tabled, deferred or unfinished business. Anybody have anything to uh, comment on? We do not have anything that was listed, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, no staff reports that we're aware of? Nope. Any new business? Uh, yes. <laughs> Dan, you have something? Okay. Well, it's just uh, information uh, to the committee. Tomorrow, uh, John is making a presentation to the County of Renfrew for the intersection of Edie and Daniel Street. As you know, the new subdivisions coming in uh, be where the curling club used to be, or curling club is rather, and there's concerns that we want to get that uh, inter uh, intersection changed. So John is making a presentation to the uh, Operations Committee of County tomorrow. And hopefully it's favorable that we can have a, a better intersection. So that's uh, information purposes only and we'll report back at the next committee how John made out. Any other new business? If not, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, it looks pretty good that our Zoom, meter, Zoom meeting went uh, fairly well, other than one screw up at the start. <laughs> and uh, with that, we'll ask for an adjournment. Mover, please. I move that we adjourn this meeting, Dan. Thank you. Seconded by John. All in favor? Perfect. We're out of here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carrie.